Hello and welcome to your favorite daily comic book channel on YouTube, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Uh, welcome to all the new watchers out there. And it is a daily video series about comics, Cartoonist Kayfabe. And we've done about 1,400 videos on various comics and cartoonists in our catalog. You can go to the YouTube homepage for Cartoonist Kayfabe and check out our search. See if we've covered your favorite comic book or your favorite creators. If we have not, leave a comment below so that we can adjust our reading list and maybe cover that one next week. I uh, also want to remind everybody that we have a Cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon. There are three different levels that will get you access to our videos early. And at the King Kayfaber level, you can actually sit in on our recording session and be the very first people to see the videos and the books that we are covering. This will give you a leg up on the Kayfabe effect. If we cover a book that you want to add to your collection, you'll be the first one trying to track down a copy. This can help if the book is rare or if it's going to go up in price once a few people start looking for it. So check out our Patreon, see what level works best for you, and uh, we'll see you there. So we got hold of kind of an interesting object here, Ed. This is a digital file, as you guys watching at home can see, but it's a collection of Mike Mignola character designs for New Gods. And I love Mike Mignola, and I kind of love his character design work. Like, going through these this week made me want to draw, which right. is something I always say is, like, a great sign for an artist. But it's incredible to think, like, Jack Kirby designs filtered through Mike Mignola's sensibilities and I guess this may have been for uh, an animated film or feature or series or something. So a little bit simplified character designs, but man, did the design shine in terms of what Kirby originally created, but also where Mike Mignola is as like a designer and artist. Totally. Uh, Mignola did uh, Cosmic Odyssey with uh, Jim Starlin, which is a book that we need to cover on this channel Definitely. sooner than later. Uh, here tell that there was some new gods thing uh, in like the late eighties that he participated in, but, uh, this is full-on Mignola. Like, the cool thing is about this kind of thing is that, uh, the, you know, it's not P. Craig Russell inking him or somebody. Like, so it's just him doing his own natural style. Uh, so it, for all intents and purposes, it's it's mature Mignola. It is. And I was wondering, I'm not sure exactly when this is from. I think late late 80s, sometime around then. And uh, you see these things like one line weight. Yeah. You know, which probably comes from... It's character designs. You're doing these kind of quickly. It's just an idea to get a sense of these characters and do a bunch of them to sort of like winnow it down into like what defines these characters visually. And you want to simplify that for animation. But I feel like there's stuff that he takes away from here that then goes Applies. into his regular style. Yeah, totally. Like these like little dots. They, they, there's a there's a Hellboy Manila Kirby Crackle. Yes. And I mean, these are Sharpies, right? Yeah, like, yeah. It's just it seems thing. like it. Sharpies are some other kind of marker because you can almost see like that chisel tip heavy you know, you've got, I think, two pens here. One right. heavy thing to fill in the blacks and then that light lime work. And this is a Kirby character that's built for Mike Mignola. This totally. is a monster design. Yeah. It's so great. But he's, with his style, he's able to get all this, like, weight. Mm -hmm. And it looks like these very, very heavy guys on these very tiny little feet. But they look rock solid. It's interesting, those those small legs, because it's almost that Sylvester X-Men stuff that was so distinct to me. And well, it looks great here. One question that I have is, like, is it more middle 90s? And is the Bruce Timm stuff out? Because because uh, this is clearly a different approach, you know? Like, yes. when Bruce Timm puts his stamp on stuff, like, it's there. Like, the JLA or Superman or anything like that. Uh, but this is clearly going in a different direction. It is. You know what? I went back here, one, just to look at the killing glove. Because, again, depending on when this is, did he fall in love with drawing these kind of big, heavy hands? Yeah, and when it was time to do Hellboy, arm, you know. Yeah, <laughs> these are great, though. The proportions are awesome. You see the big arms on this one as well. Just really attractive stuff. I like the symmetry of, like, those lines around his waist, uh, gloves and, and boots there. Yeah, there's a perspective there. Even the lines that he chooses to use in the heads, like those craggy lines, it's almost Bushmiller in the, put three lines. Right. You know, we don't need to over-render all of this stuff in the face and shadow underneath that heavy brow. That's great stuff. This video is brought to you by the books that we make. My upcoming releases include 1986, a zine celebrating the biggest year in comics history, True Crime Funnies, BW Zine, my next release is Street Angel Princess of Poverty from Image Comics coming this November. Street Angel Deadly Girl Alive and Hulk Grand Design are both available now wherever books are bought and sold. Ed Piscor's upcoming releases include Hip Hop Family Tree, The Omnibus, 
X-Men Grand Design Trilogy, reprinting all three of the X-Men Grand Design books. And Red Room, available in two trade paperbacks, as well as the current series Crypto Killers. And now back to the video. That feels like it's out of a, uh, out of a Hellboy it really comic. Does. I like looking at some of the way he distorts these legs, because I think in silhouette you could find Kirby legs that look like that. Right. But it feels like they're constructed a little bit different with Mike Mignola's uh, sensibility there. So pretty cool to see how he approaches action. That's something that always, when I see him doing action or a fight scene, always pops for me because he's so good with what I think of as static figures, you know, almost like that thoughtful pause. Right. Whenever he does action, I'm always impressed because it's something that I think like the great cartoonists have that ability to do both. And his stuff can be very kind of that horror contemplative stuff but very good at the action whenever it comes up. He's uh, it's He has such an interesting, unique style. I always wonder who is it in Hollywood that um, that gets get gravitates toward him because he wouldn't be the first thought in my mind for, like, animated animation work, but he's done, like, lots of it, you know, that uh, Atlantis thing. Yeah. And There's a it, great story. I think it was in Comic Scene Magazine about Atlantis. The I think it was a Disney production. Uh, but they brought him in after they were underway, and he said it was like his style was broken down on the boards. You know, like the artist had been looking at his work, but also like kind of dissecting it in a way that like... Like mathematics. Kind of strange to see your work, you know, scrutinized in that way. I'll have to try to find that article because it's, it's fascinating, and I do think that would be quite an experience to see your work viewed that, that way, especially right. by master artists, you know? Right. And you can see him working things out, you know, like some of the notes are really great and informative of like, well, how do we do this? You know, the stooped hunchback. And you can kind of see him like working out that shape. Like, how do I how do I sell that of this evil, decide old, you know, kind of broke down, bent over character? <laughs> Happy people of apocalypse. <laughs> it's so disturbing. Straight out of uh, Hellboy. I feel so, like I've seen witch. videos of like people on drugs wandering around the streets that look like zombies. Oh, and yeah. it really feels like this drawing. Kind of bothers me. <laughs> <laughs> More happy people. These things look like characters you could put in almost any kind of story. Totally. And you can see all the great shapes, the triangles for hair there. Man, I think more and more about the shapes and how just build those shapes into, into your compositions. Yeah, it's everything, man. And he's good with that. Like That's how you get those like curvy shoulders that, that aren't shoulders. It's just that curved line down. Yeah, you see it again and again, and you'll see it a lot in these uh, in these sketches. Full Bride of Frankenstein regalia. Totally. Those big, heavy, like, bolts that populate a lot of these characters, you know, you see them here on the sleeves instead of on the neck. That kind of stuff's a neat neat design element. Yeah, it's something he's been... They, like, the, the um, Hellboy horns, like, he was using them back in, like, the mi late, mid-'80s, man, in uh, backups in freaking Ron Friends... Thor comics when he was just drawing like these like de demons and I never really understood what what those were I was like is, is that are those lights like I never quite understood it I see a lot of uh of the Kirby Thor in the new gods which kind of makes sense if you're you know thinking of god characters but I see a lot of those motifs and I I, I think those do influence Minola. you yeah. know I don't know when he adopts that if it is around cosmic odyssey time when he goes really digs into Kirby or whatever but I feel like he does take some of those visual elements out of there it's, it's so interesting. This is a big brawny character that has no shoulders. You know, like he's he's good at that, and he, but he's got the the shoulders of like uh, your girlfriend or something. Yeah, even the arms look like they're lower. I love how it looks. You yeah. know, it's no complaint, but it is interesting because it does feel like you're building your own anatomy. The people who swipe from him, they always do that. They'll they'll they steal the shoulders for sure. It's cool going through a series, too. Like, of, I think we'll have a, several of these scot-free versions in different regalia and, like, working out some different concepts for it. There's a BPRD guy, man. There's, like, a Lobster Johnson or something that we're going to see with scot-free in a minute. Check out this idea of, like, that belt and how it moves from, you know, the belt being dark into, like, the light part where the, you know, you imagine it's a metallic right. surface. But how do you do that in a very simple way that could work in animation? And it's, like, experimenting with that in these sketches. It looks so cool. It looks so cool, like, seeing it come together and Mike Mignola meets Jack Kirby. Still dealing with those shapes, like, this arm is not even defined. Once it hits up into the torso, we don't even have a line. Right. Like, separating that, that bicep up to the shoulder. It's just all, all 
one big shape. Like, look at that, right? That's like Lobster Johnson or somebody. Totally. Yeah, totally. Some BPRD guy. Absolutely. This insignia is really neat. And uh, we'll see that, you know, it's like a war military banner. And this is probably the, about the closest to, you know, Mr. Miracle, traditional Mr. Miracle here. Moving in that direction anyway. This is fun, too, whenever he's like, okay, what if it was sleeves? What if it was cloth? You know, right. this part of the costume. Being able to represent that with that one line weight and really one line. I have such admiration for that. It's that deceptive thing of, like, simple is not easy. Yes, for sure. Yeah, you go try it. I used to read interviews with various artists, and they would talk about how, like, that's actually... It's harder to do that with one line than it is whenever you're cross-hatching everything and it's able a, to do whatever you want. Yeah, it's in every interview with every animator you've ever... This read. is one of those examples of the anatomy. I was looking at this this week and thinking, like, look at that chest and how this is drawn. I got no problem with any of this, but I would never think to draw anatomy this way. Yeah, it's ballsy. It's ballsy because the way, like, the, the way the, like, breast muscle works, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like a little kid line in a way. You wonder at some point, like, does Mike Mignola just sort of do his thing and results be damned in terms of who's going to pay for it, who wants to commission it? I think that's when it really shines, but it does look like an artist who gets very, if not confident, just don't care anymore. I'm right. drawing what I want to draw the way I want to draw it, and we'll see who the audience is. Right. This looks like an early Metron, too, because I think that it's not deep enough, the chair. You know, I think it hasn't quite figured out, like, how this should look. Right. But you really get to see that development. All those things coming into his head, too. Very awesome for Metron. Love that face. It's such a, so interesting, because I wonder what the assignment was. Because, I mean, we're really... This is all unique new stuff, you know? And, and uh, certainly, when this would have been created, it would be, like, comic fans who would be the number one audience. And they don't like that shit. They, they want to see... Orion's regular costume, you know? I do wonder if it's, like you said, post-Bruce Tim or something like that, where, because Bruce Tim's style was pretty radical. We yeah. all look at it and go, oh, it looks great now. <laughs> but when that shows up, like, that was a weird-looking Batman. The first time I saw an animated Batman, it was like, that's bizarre. And then you you watch a move, and you watch a, an, an episode, and it's like, oh, no, that's great. That's the best Batman ever done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I you know, like, that Fleischer stuff, like, I had those on tape and stuff, and I'm like, okay, they're doing, like, a Fleischer thing. So there, there was precedent, but I mean, this is far, far out and it's not, at least Batman's costume is Batman, you know, it's not, you know, this extra shit. Like you wouldn't recognize if, if that Orion was covered up, you wouldn't know what character that is. Also, um, it wouldn't surprise me if there were a few artists tasked with this. Like right. I've, I've been commissioned to do character design for, um, concept art and knowing that there are like three other guys doing it, you know, it's almost like maybe the filmmakers don't know exactly what they want. You know, if they did, why hire somebody? Yeah. It's one of the interesting things with, uh, you know, collaborative work of that sort, where it really is like, I'm going to hire this person because I like their work and see what they bring to this. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've done that where, where, like, I was the guy, but I did, like, three different versions. And it was that classic thing where, like, they chose the one that I'm like, oh. Why That's the gotta, worst why feeling we on earth. Go, why do we got to go that, that route? You get a couple of those and it's like done freelancing now for a while. <laughs> um, look at this for a pose. Very different than all the pieces we've seen so far. Different angle and also almost like weight and stuff. I, uh, I you know, it's Orion. So it's like the most important new god. Like, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this is sketch one of uh, the, the entire enterprise. Something tells me you draw Orion before you start hatching out Metron uh, schematics. I also think whenever you're doing... If it's animation work, there's almost like a couple of versions you need. You need that front piece, you need the three-quarter piece, you need that uh, side view. Yeah. And it's almost like that's what you're you're working out some of those details here. I like the way that helmet looks. Calabac. That's just pure monkey proportions, right? Oh, yeah. Man, those arms are long. And he looks dumb. Like, in the face, you know? He looks like a, like a big old... Uh... Pro mag. I mean, it's that's a monster. It's a hundred percent. That's a monster. This could have been some sort of universal monster if you re remove maybe some of the costuming. That would be right there. That brow is about as big of a brow as you could get on a character without him <laughs> tipping over. <laughs> that's fun too. I was waiting to see what this big bardo would look like. Mignolo with the skull on the helmet, though. I like you get some notes on the idea of the coloring behind this. I kind of imagine if this happens now, it's probably all digital sketches and you might get some of the color just put in there. Right. It's 
so cool. I love seeing the, the marker strokes. You know, you can imagine, man, he, he must have drawn these fast. Totally. You know, there's something to be said for that, too. If you're an artist and you're, and you're trying to work this stuff out, changing up your tempo, even if it's not for the finished pages, is just a thing that will reveal different stuff in your drawing and your style. I think there's a lot of use for that kind of thing. There's so many of those tools that you can put to use. This is a great big bar to love it. Even love the little bit of the cape blowing out. Right. I like how the lines continue on like the, the chest armor mirror the lines that come out on the cape. New Genesis. Put away that heavy black marker now. Right. This is this is our light planet. We're gonna get colors, uh, notes on colors on these characters in a minute. And those notes are about like pastel colors and this is definitely a different world. What a dramatic use of black and white. Communicates you know? it well. Female Fury is kind of an extension of your big Barda, so you have some stuff like your skull insignia. Some notes on how they vary. That's a pretty fun design. Kabuki-ish. It is. The spikes that come out of the fingers. Mm -hmm. Such simple drawings. But it's all you need if you're just communicating like an idea, you know? It's almost like, are we going to go in this direction? If so, we can do more drawings like this. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, you know, the general public was not meant to see this stuff. Love that solid mask. It reminds me of the shadow in the face that we saw earlier of Dark Side. Yeah. Where it's like everything under the brow is just shadowed out. And see, the way he's got the legs and stuff, that's where I start to think, like, this. Mu maybe this is post-Bruce Tim. But, but I, th I think it wasn't. But, like, that that's such an animation stroke. It reminded me, if, if this was the only thing I saw, I might have guessed Larry Stroman on design. Sure. Which I, you know, compliment to everybody in that in that equation. This back leg, it's literally just two arcs. Exactly. Yeah, That's yeah, amazing. It's, it's wild, man. But it's perfect for animation. And you can imagine stuff like, uh, you know, Samurai Jack or, or or those types of cartoons would ha have that kind of action. Because, like, you know, this is a static image, but that swoopy anatomy is good for motion. Definitely. A lot of these characters, even though they're relatively static... They look like they're walking up or walking away. You know, even just a little simple bend of the leg or having those legs on slightly different planes to show some perspective depth. Minor, minor things. But when I was a kid, I would draw these characters and they would be exactly straight on. It'd be like a flat action figure that you're looking down yeah. at. Yeah. Um, you know, this little, just twist them slightly. I would look at those drawings and try to figure out like, why does that drawing look better than mine? And it's all it would take to add a little bit of dimensionality. Yeah, and, and you know, that's a hard thing to learn because, like, you're drawing one arm smaller than the other, one leg smaller than the other, and it doesn't make sense in your mind. I could see this kind of thing, the edge of the marker. I could see that mark becoming a stylistic tick that you would incorporate in a character. Sure. I mean, it's in, uh, you know, Dan Green's inking with uh, J.R.J.R. And, and, like, there's, like, Al Williamson will, will use that approach uh, on, like, uh, Bullseye with J.R.J.R. Uh, and, and a couple of those other kinds of characters that have, like, a black leather or whatever. The drapery. Yeah, and it shouldn't be, right? It's It's three lines. Right. But but they're in the exact smart place. It's not they're not parallel. They're clearly coming from a point of tension. It's like uh, it's you know it's a good exercise to draw the curtains at your window. Like when you're when, right when when you uh, when you have to draw a room or something and it's like oh wow. you know you could dash out curtains and it could just look like garbage. But if you actually like look at them and you see like the points of tension how it tapers out like that's what you're getting there. And then, uh, you know, these simple faces, but they are that kind of Egon Schiele kind of proportionality. And the eyes, nose, mouth, they all still feel very solid and rooted inside of a skull. You yeah. Know, it, it, there's a, you can play with anatomy as much as you want and do whatever you want. But, like, the drawing that you make has to have solidity, has to have anatomy. This reminds me a little bit of Aeon Flux, like some of exactly. the Exactly, that's features. what I mean about the, like that Chile type mm -hmm. uh, vibe and the, the, the equine elongated faces and stuff. Hair yellow or like fire. That's a great note. Love, he's very good at doing this, like having like your, some tubes or wiring coming off. Even that weird thing on top of his head. <laughs> kind of cool. Very steampunk. 
Is this the Hunger Dogs or something? Yeah, I don't know. Parademon. This has to be post Hellboy, right? This stuff is so Hellboy. Right. I feel like it's got to be after he's been on Hellboy a little bit. If that's the case, then it is like uh, Bruce Tim is out there doing his thing then. Because, because I mean, it is worth noting that Hellboy was not the the crown jewel of the legend line for some, for some time. He just fucking stuck with it. Yeah, he kept making great comics, and eventually, like, you just couldn't deny it. I love this uh, dog. Yeah, it's such a dog that he's that he's riding on. It's so believable. <laughs> and then sometimes it's a little little hunger dog. This one's really hungry. I was enjoying these high father sketches because of the abstraction of like the noses and the face. Look at that face. It's not even a nose. Don't even right. bother with the nose on that one. It's not what we're focusing on. But I mean like that's about as abstract as you can get. Those eyes, that nose, unbelievable. Yeah, it's it's really fascinating cuz like choosing to put that line down the middle, like what where that nose, it's actually lighting. You know, it's it's like that's double lighting. You know, it's shadow in the middle of the nose and shadow in the middle of that little, like, cleft or whatever. One of the things to take away from this, personally, is the idea of the shapes. Because oh, yeah. when you look at his legs and feet, like, they're really just blocking out shapes. Totally. And it was, it's, it's, it's wrong, but it's solid. Like, it feels like the character's really standing. You could... You don't have to be, uh, you know, Brian Bolland to, to like, make great figures believable figures but be consistent you know i bet not even penciled right right i was just thinking that it's such it's such a doodle but again you're just communicating like an idea it's all the information that you need is is represented there this is not going to be the poster art it's true and like when you get to this doodle spot, you probably did 10 others where you did some penciling and now you, it's, you're kind of in that flow state. It's remarkable how much information is on here for what looks like a quick drawing. Yeah. And not very many lines. Like like that furrowed eyebrow. <laughs> That's three lines. Yeah, man. Looks like a craggly old wrinkled up forehead. That's the thing that blows the, like, the animated animation guys' fucking minds too, man, is like how fast comic book dudes can work. Right. Like, I've had that exact feedback. And it's like, so you're paying me by the day, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so true. Because, well, you, know, you know, like, it's like, it's like, Cal like Hollywood is like two hour lunches laissez faire, but like, New York comics print is deadline based, man. So, like, we're just faster, speedier artists. It's definitely a different model that, we, that you're used to working under from comics. Totally. Yeah, it's hard to tell how long this took. Like, realistically, not long. Week. It could be be a weekend. Yeah, it could be. You know how many pages total? Do, like, did we just look through? Sixty, I think. Wait, what's I say down there? Sixty-seven. Yeah. There it is, man. Mike Mignola, New Gods, sketches and character designs. Super fun. Somebody, somebody sent that to us because you would see those images floating around. Somebody finally, finally uh, coalesced them all into a PDF, and I'm like, fuck, man, that's an episode. Yeah, I wonder, like, how much other stuff like this exists, because this is the kind of stuff that's often behind an NDA. Right. You know, like, I don't know that Mike Mignola still owns these drawings. Like, it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, turn those into the studio, they commission them, and that's it. That's how a lot of this concept art works, you know? Yeah. Like, all the concept art that I was talking about doing, you can't I don't know that anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that went into the, the people that were paying me. That's what they bought from me. So... I wonder, like, also how much of this stuff exists, like other people's stuff. Because totally. I know a lot of favorite artists who have done a ton of this kind of work. And if more of it's out there, man, share links in those comments, <laughs> people. Because, like, I think there's a lot to learn from this. Yeah, totally. Totally, man. Like, like I, you know, in the other room, I got 3,000 pieces of art that's that's locked up behind an NDA with a Mongo Wrestling Alliance and stuff, man. Can't show that stuff off te technically you know it's been 15 years or something probably could they wouldn't give a fuck now but uh there's technicalities to it for sure good to go i am K Faber's like follow subscribe to the youtube channel hit the bell so that we can notify you when new videos are available we are a daily youtube channel and we have more than 1400 videos in our catalog as we speak that means we might have talked about your favorite comics one way to find out go to the front page of the cartoonist K Fab youtube channel Hit the little search field on our page. That's the magnifying glass. 
give your favorite comics a search. Uh, if we did not talk about your faves, by all means, let us know in the comments so that we can push those books higher on our uh, to-read piles. We have a Patreon where the King Kayfabers can hang out with us while we record these videos. We we have a private uh, stream that we uh, post up and and uh, share in dialogue with. And uh, the King Kayfabers also get all the videos before anybody else mitigates the Kayfabe effect, which is when we talk about rare uh, comics or books or st stuff like that. They'll have the first dibs on the aftermarket for the things that we are talking about. But the videos ultimately are brought to you by the books that we make. And this holiday season is rapidly approaching, and uh, October 18th is when the Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus is coming to stores. That means that your comic shop is able to order this book, and they need to do so uh, in order for it to show up at the shop. So go let them know to order this comic uh, so that you can put it on your bookshelves. It has 150 pages of additional stuff beyond the four volumes of Hip Hop Family Tree. It's the best book I ever made, and I hope that you uh, add this to your to your library. I have X-Men Grand Design Trilogy coming out in November, collecting all of my X-Men Grand Design works. Uh, some of those books are out of print as we speak, so this is your uh, chance to get all of X-Men Grand Design in one handy dandy soft, soft cover. Red Room is my current comics project. There are two trade paperbacks of Red Room in existence as we speak. And the third round of Red Room Comics is uh, near completion. Uh, the third issue of Crypto Killers has this backup feature with my future daily strip characters in there. So it's the first appearance of them anywhere in print. Uh, and it will be considered a hot key once my uh, daily strip starts coming out in January 2024. Uh, I am serializing that daily strip on my Patreon, though. So you could hit up my Patreon and, and check the strips out that way. Jimmy, tell the people what you have uh, on the horizon. Street Angel Princess of Poverty will be coming to your comic shop in November from Image Comics. It collects all of the Street Angel comics that are not in Deadly Scroll Alive and will make the uh, the complete Street Angel set. But you need to pre-order that one now. So the next time you're at your comic shop, let them know that you want a copy of Street Angel Princess of Poverty so that they can pre-order that one. Hulk Grand Design, my treasury edition of the Hulk Grand Design is out now and uh, nearly sold out now. So if you haven't picked up a copy yet, do that soon because there's no guarantee that this will even be reprinted. And uh, once it disappears, it'll be gone. So pick that one up if you haven't already. I have been self-publishing. These are two of my latest zines. BW celebrates the black and white explosion of the 80s self-published comics. And 1986 celebrates the greatest year in comics history from Dark Knight to Mouse, Watchmen, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle ripoffs, and a lot more. I've also self-published True Crime Funny as a collection of short nonfiction comics, including two wrestling comics. You can read these right now at patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. And uh, I will be offering these for sale on my website later this year, probably a pre-holiday sale. So if you want them in print, you will get an, an opportunity to pick those up probably in late October. The books are our most important part of the channel, but there are some other ways to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe Network. Let the people know, Jimmy. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, mugs, uh, fanny packs, stickers, and lots more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video in the show notes. There you have it. All the different ways that you can keep this channel coming to you on a regular basis. Give them the marching orders, Jimmy, and we'll be on our way. Make more comics.